um, the House of Representatives um, is a, a, a body that's, of course, made up of 435 members, but each district is of equal size. What you see in the interior is a lot of red, but don't be fooled by it. It's not a lot of North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, you're only looking at one, two, and fewer seats. Um, the coasts are overwhelmingly blue. The big urban areas, whether they're in the center of the country in Chicago, Denver, um, the big urban areas tend to be um, overwhelmingly Democratic, hence the Democrats' slight, if not large, majority. This is the play of seats in the um, U.S. Senate, and you're going to get another idea of what's really going on. Um, the red seats are the um, Republicans, blue, of course, Democrats, and you can see how many, many more Republican seats are in play. Many of them are in the South and the Midwest, um, but states like Montana, excuse me, like Maine, Colorado, those are where the Republicans are probably most vulnerable. Many believe actually now um, Arizona. I don't have that as a red because Arizona is uh, Miss McSally's who was appointed to fill an unexpired term of another senator who was filled on to fill an unexpired term of, of course, Senator John McCain, who died some years ago. Um, these are the states in which gubernatorial elections are important. I mention this because in states which cannot come to an agreement through their legislatures for redistricting, governors and um, either uh, statewide boards made up of governors and other statewide elected officials, and you get a sense of where some of these fights are going to be. Indiana, West Virginia, North Carolina become fairly important, as does Missouri. Dr. Stein, if I could, yeah. could you, we've had a request that you um, go to the like full slide view because some people can't see the entire slide. Uh, okay, maybe so me, from current Let me do that again. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not quite certain why that's not working. Hmm. Let me just end the show and start it again. Okay, I got the slideshow. How, is that better? Not on my screen. It's the same. Oh, oh I am sorry. Um, let me get out of this. You I think you can correct this by going to the top right, click on view, and then click on standard, and you will get a larger copy of the slides. All right, let me get that. I got to find standard. I'm doing view. Not you, Dr. Stein. I'm talking about the viewers. If the viewers go to the oh, top the right yeah. of your screen, click on those three dots to get view, then click on the standard view, you'll get a larger screen, a larger slide. I will try to, is that any better for everybody? So these are the, uh, state houses that are up for re-election. I'll uh, point out that there are a lot. Um, there are as many as, of course, the Republicans have a 29 to uh, 20 advantage um, in uh, state houses. Um, and state houses in Texas, the state house in Texas is, of course, a major source of um, Democratic ambition. Um, to give you kind of an idea here, in Texas at least, um, where we, of course, will be redrawing boundaries for legislative offices, in 2010, the last time we drew boundaries, the last time we had a census, the Republicans held 100 of 150 seats in the Texas State House. In every election since 2010, the Democrats have picked up more seats than they've lost. So that that 50 seat margin that the Republicans had in 2000, 2010 has dropped to nine. If the Democrats pick up nine seats in the 2020 election, they will control the Texas State House. The Senate is not likely to be in play simply because there are not enough seats um, that are available. Um, but if the Texas um, Democratic Party picks up those nine seats, they will not only control the House, they'll get to choose the next speaker, and they may be in a position to have more influence, not just on legislation and, of course, important committees, but they may have more influence on drawing congressional district boundaries. So let's look at where the election might stand today. Um, what I'd like to do is this is from the New York Times um, poll aggregator. And what's interesting here is that if you just look at the polls, and these are states that we believe um, are mostly in play. 
Um, not many, and I think this list is probably twice, if not maybe even three times longer than I would identify, but the Democratic candidate Biden is leading in virtually every state but a handful. And today, um, a new poll came out um, from uh, Texas, uh, University of Texas at Tyler and the uh, Dallas Morning News showing that um, Texas was actually um, flipping towards uh, Biden. But what's interesting is polls can and have, and some think are wrong. And so what you have in the two right uh, columns is a um, picture of what the poll numbers might look like if they were just as wrong as they were in 2016, if you believe they were wrong, and if they were just as wrong if you in, in 2012. And again, um, there's not a lot of pickup here, but considerably more pickup. But what it shows basically is it's a pretty close race. Um, in spite of the popular vote, which will certainly, absolutely go for Biden. Um, most, there isn't a Republican probably had doubts that. The only way the president wins it selection is through the Electoral College, which means what? That if President Trump does get reelected, he will be yet the third election in this century in which the elected uh, president through the Electoral College failed to win the popular vote, either in a plurality or in a straight majority, which we can talk about later on. So what does the actual betting market look like? If you um, are just looking at states where the candidates lead by three or more, um, Vice President Biden has a big lead. If you're looking at electoral votes, if polling translates perfectly into the results, which they won't, that margin gets even bigger. But the more likely one at this point is that the electoral votes were, if they were as wrong as they were in 2016, Biden would win by, by a hefty margin, 309 to 229. Um, but again, somewhere between 326 and 309, there's a lot of chance for President Trump to close that. Let me point out something that you might not know. Um, there will be, of course, a lot of votes cast by mail in this election. It's estimated that 75% of Americans can, if they choose to, vote by mail. As of today, 47% in 2016 have already been cast. So half, almost half of the electorate, if we think that the turnout is about the same as 216, which I don't myself, I think will be higher. Now look at the states that have mail and absentee ballots. In 2016, in our own state of Texas, 7% of voters cast their ballot by mail. As of today, it's estimated that 25% of all votes that will be cast, including election, they will be by mail. And that number can go up to as probably high as 30 or even 35. What happens with mail ballots, as opposed to in-person voting, is that ballots have to be opened and verified. Signatures have to be matched. Paper ballots, not electronic voting, have to be scanned and tabulated. When you have a fourfold increase of mail-in voting, and look at all the states that have mail-in voting, it's all the states, what you see is that a good number of those states will not be able to process mail ballots before election day. Our own state of Texas allows ballots to be processed before election day. And in fact, they can happen up to three weeks. Um, in other states, um, it's as soon as they're, they're delivered. But look at the states that only allow you to process mail ballots on election day. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Alabama, and Mississippi. Pennsylvania and Wisconsin are battleground states. And my suspicions are that there's a good chance that on election night, you will not know the results from Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. If, as I suspect, President Trump will win, Pen will win Florida, we will be waiting. How long? Wisconsin has six days to count mail ballots received and postmarked on election day. And Pennsylvania similarly has six days. So you may not know the results if those two states are still counting ballots. And as I said before, states like Florida and probably our own state of Texas 
have already been declared, and as I suspect will be declared more than likely, but not certainly by any means for President, for, for President Trump. So what does mail balloting mean? It means you don't get the results when you want them. And I'll even go so far as to say, there's always a possibility that states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin will release no election results early or in person on election day until they have canvassed all of the votes. And that means, of course, counting the paper ballots that are delivered by mail. Um, what's changed and made these elections? If, if you're not familiar with what's been happening in this century, elections are getting closer. Um, they're getting closer in the popular vote. They're getting closer in the electoral vote. They're getting closer in more and more states. In 2000, we just had to watch Florida. By the time we were getting to um, the 2016 election, although it was quick, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan all turned for President Trump by margins of barely 10,000 votes, often uh, out of um, as many as 5 million votes cast. And the answer is the electorate is changing. There is a steady decline in white voters without college degrees. And if you look at from the, on the verdict on the horizontal axis here, starting in 1976, going to 2018, you can see that the share of minority voters went from 11 to 27, more than a twofold increase. The share of whites with college degrees went from 17 to 34, a doubling. And yet, as might you expect, white voters without college degrees, which were almost, well, they were 71%, were cut by almost half. So you're seeing a dramatic change. This is nationally. I'd argue in a moment, this is what you're seeing throughout the country. The share of eligible voters who cast ballots in the midterm election, you can begin to see white voters with college degrees, white voters without college degrees, and minority voters are all going up. So participation rates among these groups that are changing are going up. For those of you who have not seen this, I, I don't have the table here. Um, we are not declining in voter turnout. Since the turn of the century, since 2000, voter participation in both midterm and presidential elections has been going up slowly in a, in a small amount, but has been going up both as a percent, but more importantly, in terms of total number of votes and people showing up. These are the battleground states, and I want to point out that the trend I showed you earlier, this trend, shows up here in battleground states, and in some cases, even more so. So what you're beginning to see is what happened in the country is happening in these more competitive states, only there, I think, the, uh, the changes are a little bit steeper, and they've happened earlier than they did in other parts of the country. The best way to put it is, this is becoming a more educated, but distinctively non-Anglo electorate. Hmm. Support for Trump in states with close races, you can begin to see what's happening. Trump wins with white, no college educated voters, but Biden wins with white college educated. And the numbers here I think are even more important. And, and, and let me point to the Hispanic vote. This idea that the Hispanic vote is solidly a democratic vote, both in Texas, Florida, and other major areas like California, I think is a little bit of an exaggeration. There's a substantial portion, a third, um, with independents there being probably um, slightly leaning, I think, in my, in my reading of it, towards Trump. Um, but generally, non-Anglo voters, about better than two to one, are voting for, of course, um, Biden. So again, when you see the demographic shift and you overlay that onto voting, you begin to see why somebody like Donald Trump's in his 2016 election was barely able to eke out an electoral victory, but has not moved the needle on his support or job ratings, independent of the economy, COVID, or for that matter, his own personal um, evaluation by voters. And again, as I've said, let me just go back a table here because I want to make this point. This is not a trend that happened overnight. This is a trend that started in 1976 and has been playing out for the better part of almost 50 years. Look at the change in just the voting age population. In these battleground states, what you're beginning to see is that the population of voters 
who are voting is getting younger. It's inevitable. Even with Medicare and Medicaid and ACA, voters will eventually age out of the electorate. And what this does is again, along with the other demographics, age is just one of them, race and gender, education, you can begin to see how the candidacy of somebody like uh, Joe Biden has a much better chance than the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Assuming for the moment, there are no differences between the candidates, which of course we can't. I'm sorry, I'm... The share of voters by age, Gen X, millennials, this is just a better way to put it. Baby boomers, my generation, were 38% of the vote at the beginning of the century. In 2000, we dropped almost 10 points. Millennials, Gen Xers, Gen Zers, which not a lot of them, they're now coming into the electorate. And they're coming into the electorate, not because they woke up one morning and said, it's time to vote. They come into the electorate because as they age, they get jobs, they get married, they buy homes, they have children, not necessarily in that order. All of these things that connect you to wanting to vote, not only at the federal and the state level. Why are baby boomers in, the, in what we call the silent majority? And these are people, of course, born before the um, post-war baby boom. Um, they simply are leaving the electorate. Yeah, older voters vote more frequently than younger voters, but at some point they cease to stop, they cease voting, either because they die or their illnesses and their infirmities and disabilities um, make it harder and harder for them to vote. What about Texas? Red to purple. I apologize, I've got all these little things coming up on my computer. So this is the partisan distribution of all registered voters at the end of 219. Um, there's a group called uh, Smart Vote. If you want, I can explain how we do this. No, we do not have party registration in Texas. This is sort of not a hard exercise, but what's important at the end of 219, after the 218 election, the difference between um, Republican and partisan Democrats was about six points. A big difference. If I told you what that difference was in 210, it would be twice that, almost 12 to 15 in terms of people who actually show up at the polls. Now, what I did was I looked at swing Texas House of seats, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. And these are Texas House seats that the Democrats think they can take away from Republicans. They're currently held by Republicans. And the question is, as I said before, where are those nine seats that the Democrats might pick up? And what I did was I looked at the nine seats, I actually looked at about 25 seats that Democrats have claimed, the Democratic Party, are winnable seats for Democrats in this Texas House election. And I asked the next question, have they picked the right seats? And it would appear so, that the difference between partisan preferences in these swing seats, about 25 of them, is no more than 3%, obviously a 50% drop here. And you'll notice where the big increase is. The biggest increase is in independence. And Democrats think they might be able to win some of those seats. Where are these targeted seats? Now I'm using mostly Democratic um, campaign material, but they're in the Metroplexes. They're in the Dallas Tarrant area. They're in our own Harris County Fort Bend. Many more are in the Valley where Hispanics and a few in the Travis um, and uh, one in the San Antonio area. So what are these seats? These are the seven seats that I've identified from the Democrats list where Democratic candidates did pretty well in 218, the two-way vote came within a hair, where Hillary Clinton either won or came also close, where non-Anglo voters are not anywhere near a majority, but together an important advantage, and where the Republicans, frankly, had a bigger fundraising. These are seats. I would add to this seat one that I think some of you are probably familiar with, and that's 131st, 34th, where Sarah Davis is. I'd actually move that up into my top seven and make it an eight. So you can begin to see that if I were handicapping, I think there are six, seven, or as many as eight seats that Democrats 
are very competitive for. Hard to see where they get that nine seat, but again, given these kinds of margins and um, what are now new statewide polls, it remains to be seen whether Republicans can hold on. What's most interesting about these lists are all of them, but one in the Harless seat here in the, in the Northwest part of the county are in the Dallas Tarrant County area. Again, I put the Sarah Davis seat in a, in the, in what I call a prospect, but I'm putting that into a, into the category. The rest of the seats here are probably well without outside the range, but they give you an idea. They're mostly in Metro Houston. They're mostly in the, uh, the Valley or up in the, of course, um, Dallas Fort Worth area or the better way to put it is the Democrats really are in a hunt. Let me, um, and I'm looking at my clock here, I wanna keep myself, let me explain what I think is going on in terms of polarization. And um, a couple of figures here will help. Now these are uh, data compiled from the Pew Charitable Trust, who's been doing surveys um, for the last quarter century or, or, or even longer. And what they have done is surveyed tens of thousands of voters, identifying people who tell us they're consistently liberal or consistently conservative on a range of issues dealing with gun control, health care, foreign policy, same-sex marriage, um, abortion, and ways in which to ask, what are the differences between Democrats and Republicans? And the picture here, I hope it's easily seen, is that between 1994 and 2014, you see a separation. In, two, in 1994, Democrats and Republicans were consistently conservative only at the fringes of their party, but the purple areas, the overlap, was greater than the, than the tails of the distribution. Over those 10 and 20 years, what you've seen is a hollowing out of the center. The center has become wider and wider. And so what you're beginning to see is Republicans are consistently more conservative and liberals consistently, and Democrats consistently more liberal. If you look at this in terms of just all Republicans, all Democrats, what you see is that 64, 70, and 92%, the movement of Republicans being consistently more conservative on any of the public policy issues that were before the voters at the time. And the Democrats moving almost exactly in proportion in the opposite direction. So that it produced a situation where there was no center. In 94, you see a single peak of people who tell them tell you that they're mixed in terms of their ideological view. That number starts dropping to where it's now 39%, and the tails of the distribution are getting almost as large as the center. American politics has always been about compromise, but you can't compromise if there's not a center. This picture gets even more extreme if we just look at people who are engaged in politics. Here we compare two groups, the same population of voters, but we look at people who are politically engaged. And what do I mean by that? The simple answer is a, a measure, they vote. They vote regularly in midterm and presidential elections, follow politics and support candidates. And what you see is that by 2004, that hollowing out of Democrats and Republicans has gotten twice as large among people who are voting than people who are not. If candidates want to win elections, who do they listen to? The engaged, not the unengaged. They form policies, they promulgate pot platforms, and they vote for candidates and for Supreme Court justices that reflect this distribution, not this. What are the origins of this? I'll go through this rather quickly. The best way to think about this is a party affiliation is based on your social group affiliation. It's acquired from your parents' genes and from their nurturing. Partisans, Democrats and Republicans, they behave more like sports fans than bankers. They're not choosing an investment. They're not looking for the party and candidate that will give them the most. They're looking for emotional connection to people who look and act and believe like they do. It could be race, it could be income, it could be um, job, it could be college education, but they prefer 
to join parties with people like themselves. <clears throat> and that leads them to, to engage in social behaviors with people who are not only like them, but share their partisan and party connection. I'm sorry. This makes it extremely difficult to close that gap if people who are like each other tend to live around each other. There are about 18,000 precincts in the state of Texas and less than 5% of them, the, part, the margin of vote, Democratic and Republican, is anywhere near 50%. In virtually every precinct, you can identify the Democrat and Republican voters by the fact that they are 80 or more percent likely to vote for one party or the other and do it consistently over time. There are some that are changing, but you can begin to see then if geography becomes a basis of segregation by party, social group, then it becomes very hard for these groups of individuals to have conversations in which they may engage in that tells them we're not that different. We don't have that many controversies over policy. I won't go into the whole mechanism of sorting, but I will show you what the consequences are of this. Most liberals prefer to live with liberals and most conservatives overwhelmingly prefer to live with conservatives. So the sorting isn't an accident. It isn't happenstance. It's a choice that individuals make. Most liberals, when asked about Barack Obama and Republican leaders, you can begin to see that their ratings of the opposite party almost completely driven by how they identify their partisan and ideological preferences. Let me show you something about policy. This is, explain what this is. This is simply um, how Republican and Democratic senators voted in 1973-1974. If you look at the right side and the left side, simply is pro-Democratic, pro-Republican. The black line is how Republicans were voting and the gray line, how the Democrats. And the important thing is look at the overlap. Yeah, Democrats tended to vote with Democrats and Republicans tended to vote with Republicans. But in 1973 to 1974, there was a significant overlap, a place where compromise, where agreements between seemingly different political actors could take place. In fact, this looks just like the distribution that we talked about. If I run all the way back up, and I apologize for this, for that's what the world looked like in 1994, and that's the way it looked like pretty much in 19. 74. This is how it looked in 2011. Oh, that's so scary. There was no overlap. Uh, there is no point of agreement. Oh my God. The only other time this has happened, um, I shouldn't say the only, I want to be very clear. The one that in, in recent memory, we could go back to the Vietnam War. We could go back to the McCarthy era, red baiting. But for those of you who are not around, but heard John Ball's lecture, this is what the Civil War looked like. It was oh, no center. Oh gosh, it's going to be the Civil War. Well, let's I hope not. There is a solution for this problem, and I'm going to quickly go through it because I am running out of time, and I I do apologize for going too long. David Mayhew, who's probably um, one of the finest political scientists um, our country's produced, wrote a famous book called The Imprint of Congress. He wrote some other wonderful books as well. And what he claimed is that this polarization is neither new, maybe not even abnormal. He pointed out again, the 1850s, the 1870s, which witnessed horrific polarization that led to, of course, the Civil War. He identifies the period of the McCarthy era and the post-war Red Scare and the Vietnam era war, which many of us can remember. But he talks about things that corrected that. And what I find interesting is that he looked at public policies. Now, these are not policies that are probably familiar with to you. In another world, in another language, we would call these pork barrel programs. But they're not the pork barrel that goes just to one constituency or one congressional district or one state or even one region. The Northwest Ordinance Act of 1787 ceded land to every state 
for the purposes of public education and other public services. The federal government just gave everybody something and they got an equal share. The land grant colleges, the Morrill Act of 1862, that was when Lincoln was president and fighting a civil war and not doing particularly well. The act was extended in 1890 and it of course created many land grant colleges that we know in the Big Ten. The Highway Trust Fund, Eisenhower, he figured out you couldn't get from A to B unless you had a road and you couldn't just have one road. Roads were built everywhere. The examples I'm offering here is a way to bind the country land grant colleges, clean water, the National Science Foundation, the Highway Trust Fund. These are things that we all benefit from. A road in Kansas is as important as a road in New York because it connects Kansas. It gets me from New York to Kansas and it gets me to meet people and see things I wouldn't see if I didn't have that road. Even the St. Lawrence Seaway, which you would think would be only a benefit to the St. Lawrence Seaway areas along the Great Lakes, is of course a connection of waterways to freeways to railroads. What Mayer was suggesting is that these actions, these launchings of new national public policies bind us together in a way that politically everyone supports because if I don't support it, you don't get your benefit. But the actual policies drive benefits not just to the entire country, but bind us together in ways that we would not have imagined before. So I guess I'm saying in a, in a simple word, I'm gonna end my uh, the PowerPoint. I hope I can do that. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to stop the, oh. Uh, before we have recovered. It doesn't necessarily have to end like the Civil War. Although I would contend that the, the period of the McCarthy witch hunts and even the Vietnam War um, were not as, how can I say, calm and without their own violence. But what's important is that we have the institutional mechanisms through legislation that can bind country, the, the, the different disparate parts of the country together, both legislatively and politically. As to the outcome of this election, I'll leave it to others who prognosticate. I'll simply say that um, it may not be an early election night. One hopes it will be. If you want a, a way to watch the election, watch for Florida. I'm assuming the president will win Florida, but if by any chance, shape or form, the president loses Florida, then it's an early night. I don't see any way that which the president can win Florida, of course, is an East Coast, Eastern time zone state. You'll know their results by no later than nine o'clock. They may even call Florida as early as eight. That would be seven o'clock our time. Um, Texas will take a little bit longer, but not much. Um, again, I don't expect Texas to turn um, blue, but I do expect it will be, if you remember, President Trump won Texas by nine points, down from 12 that Romney won it by, and I think down from 15 by McCain, but, um, I don't believe the president will win Texas by more than five points. Be happy to answer any questions. I hope I haven't gone too long. Actually, Dr. Stein, I think you've rounded, you've quit kind of early. We still have um, oh, 20, well, minutes, I 20 can... minutes until the hour. So I've asked people to post questions in the chat line and I'm, I posted one, so I'll start with my question, which is you earlier mentioned, said you were willing to talk about the Electoral College, so I'd like you to do that. Why was it adopted into the Constitution? What advantages did it offer back at the time of the Constitution? Has it outlived its usefulness? And what are the chances of eliminating it? Let's start with the last one, slim and none. We're not getting rid of the Electoral College. Um, changing the rules of the game requires a level of unanimity um, that we just simply don't have in American um, political life. Two, um, its origins, of course, at the Constitutional Convention. It was proposed by several drafters of the Constitution, um, particularly Madison, 
um, a man named Wilson from all places, Pennsylvania. And of course, the concern was small and big states. If you recall, the uh, founding fathers, there were no founding mothers at that convention, came to the sense that there were too many big states and too many little states, and the little states were afraid they would be voted out in a popular vote. In fact, there was no discussion early on of a popular vote electing the president. There were discussions of state legislatures doing it, and the Electoral College came up to address three maybe big concerns. Number one was big states and small states were afraid that they would lose their, um, the smaller states would be wiped out in the vote. The three-fifths compromise, which allowed the southern states, which were disproportionately smaller states, to count their slaves towards their representation in their electoral vote. The purpose of it was to balance, as was the House and Senate, where the Senate was equal representation regardless of your size, and the House was supposed to provide um, representation proportional to the populations. We were always for majority rule, but the fear, and it was ironic that Madison, who wrote in the Federalist Papers, was most afraid, not of the tyranny of the minority, but the tyranny of the majority. Um, and as a consequence, the Electoral College was offered. Has it outlived its useful purpose? Absolutely. We've had five, I think it is, elections in which the president has been elected without the popular vote, but with the electoral vote. The election of 1876 falls into that category, but it's of course you know, ushered in the Jim Crow period. The important point is that why has it outlived its usefulness? Look at how many of those elections in which the president was elected without the popular vote have occurred in this century, 2000, of course, 2016, and surely 2020 should um, President Trump be reelected. I don't think there's a person on the earth or in the solar system or in the galaxy who would take a bet that President Trump will win the popular vote. He lost it by over 3 million votes in 2016. Some estimates have been as high as seven. If the turnout is high, my sense is that it will be probably between three and five million votes. You cannot instill in the public, in the electorate, confidence and outcomes of elections if majority rule does not prevail. I don't think the Electoral College will be removed. My colleague, uh, Randy Stevenson, who's more eminent on this, um, and Mark Jones, who writes on these issues in European and, and, and Latin American countries, will point out the simple solution is to go to proportional voting. You see some of that evidence increasingly in states that are trying to find out uh, ways to um, have elections with two parties or even without parties, nonpartisan, and use things like rank order voting. But outcomes that are perverse against majority rule tend to erode the voters' confidence in not only in the outcome of the elections, but in the legislative and judicial enactments. And um, I fear that our democracy, which has near 300 years of what I call sunk capital, can survive this, but not much longer. Um, and there has to be a resolution to that. That's why I mentioned the Mayu work. Electoral college is not going away. It's like a, like a rule in any game, basketball, baseball. You don't change rules quickly because you're always trying to figure out who's advantage. And right now, of course, the Republicans recognize that getting rid of the electoral college would tremendously disadvantage them. Um, I, I, I can see Karen George, um, whose daughter was uh, one of my favorite students, I got this feeling, Karen, her, your daughter is like through law school and the former students grow up too quick. Um, but she was asking about local races. Um, so let me tell you about two or three of them. I think let's start with the House seat, Texas House seats. I think the Sarah Davis against Ann Johnson's a really fascinating race. Uh, Sarah Davis um, uh, is it's 134th. It's right around Rice, where we are, or some of you. And um, Sarah Davis beat Ellen Cohn some years ago, 2010 to be exact, a big upset. And um, what was surprising was that Sarah Davis was a Republican, but much more moderate, and so moderate that in 2018, Governor Greg Abbott didn't want her to be reelected and actually financed, actually found, encouraged, and financed the candidate to run against her in the primary because he felt that Sarah Davis was much too liberal on a wide range of issues, particularly dealing with women's rights and reproductive rights. Um, as a consequence, Sarah Davis won that election because the people in her constituency who had voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton and Beto O'Rourke in 16 and again in 18, flipped over and voted for Sarah Davis, the Republican. If you remember that 2018 election, another Republican was on the ballot, a highly respected 
county judge named Ed Emmett, now my colleague in the political science department. And Ed Emmett had won um, elect re-election uh, previously with, I estimated by as much as 40 to 45% of Democratic vote. His opponent wasn't very strong, but in 2018, his opponent seemed to be an unknown woman named Helena Hidalgo, not so unknown to us now. She, of course, won. And what that is an example of is party polarization. Many, many Democrats who liked Ed Emmett, who rated him as an effective leader, particularly in the um, cleanup after hurricanes, Harvey, and before, now felt they could not vote for a Republican. And I fear that if you are a Republican or even a fan, regardless of her partisanship of Sarah Davis, she is likely to suffer the same fate. Um, Republican, uh, Democratic voters in that district are sophisticated, to know, sophisticated enough to know that electing Sarah Davis will give the Republicans a better chance of keeping their majority in the House. And Sarah Davis has never been effective at persuading a Republican majority in the House, or for that matter, in the legislature, about any of her legislative agendas. Yes, she's a moderate voice, but I think she falls by the wayside, or much like I think a Miss uh, Collins in um, Maine does. Many like Miss Collins, but they're not it's not about voting for the Senator Collins or State Representative Sarah Davis. It's about giving the Republicans a majority in the Senate or in the Texas House. There are a couple of other races. Um, uh, the race for um, the House seat that Dan Crenshaw holds, um, a former Congressman Poe's seat, um, uh, a woman named Ledger Vardy. I would have thought that seat is relatively safe for Dan Crenshaw, but I would say at this point, he'll probably win that seat. But what matters there is how much he wins it by. Why? Redistricting. There's simply not enough Republicans to go around in this area. And a man named McCall up the road towards A&M is also in a tough race. And when you draw boundaries and you increase congressional representation, as we will have in the 2020 census, two, three, I don't think we'll get four. It means that Republicans are looking to run up the vote in 2020, like Dan Crenshaw, to be certain that he gets a favorable boundary. The seat out in Fort Bend County between Kilkarni um, Sri Kokarni and the uh, former Sheriff Nels would have, and that's of course held by a former um, Rice um, uh, graduate. Um, that's a close race. Um, normally I would not have thought it, but I think Kokarni is probably within striking distance. He did pretty well in 218, although he did lose by more than five points. But again, the district, just like what I've sh showed you in Texas and the nation, is demographically changing. And there, the biggest change, I think, is in non-Anglo voters, particularly South Asians. Um, watch a race up towards Austin. I think it's the 22nd Congressional. I always get the numbers mixed up. It's the seat that Chip Roy holds. Chip Roy was the former chief of staff, took Senator Cruz. He won his seat in 218, not by a big margin, by about three points. But the district has also changed. And who is he running against? Wendy Davis, pink running shoes. Wendy Davis, who, as you all remember, ran against um, uh, Greg, excuse me, uh, uh, Rick Perry for his last race. Um, she didn't do it particularly well in the governor's race, but I think she has a very good chance of upsetting um, Chip Roy there. Um, I would look for that to be a swing. I don't believe that Fletcher against uh, Wesley Hunt um, has, I think she's in a relatively safe position, even with Biden somewhat inappropriate, if not gaff about going away from a carbon, um, mostly because people like our own former chairman of the board, Bobby Tudor, pointed out nothing new about that. I mean, even Texas oil people know moving towards sustainability makes them more money, but we can talk about that later. Um, I don't think that uh, Congressman Allard up in Dallas, which is a pickup, is in jeopardy. And then, of course, there are two other seats in the El Paso area. One is, of course, former Congressman Hurd, or soon to be former. He did not choose to run for election. And then there's the, um, the better or work seat. So I, I, I would imagine that Democrats have a very good chance of picking up between um, no less than one. I mean, they'll definitely pick up one seat in the Hurd seat. And I think they have a good chance of picking up as many as three. And as I said before, the Texas State House races um, are, are, are close, but I'd say if I were being very, very conservative, six might be the number the Democrats will pick up. They still have to defend the Rosenthal seat. Um, I don't think that Gates seat um, uh, with Moskowitz out in Fort Bend um, is likely to be a pickup for the Democrats. I hope I've touched on many of the seats. Um, no, I don't think any statewide races um, for Supreme Court and Railroad Commissioner are, are in the reach. Um, 
Should I look at the chat for questions or? Uh, Jim Tucker made a comment that uh, perhaps president popular voting could take the wind out of the sails for DC statehood and PR statehood. Jim, do you want to add anything to your comment? Okay. Uh, so. No, that's just uh, uh, another aspect of the uh, popular uh, election issue. You know, there's a question from Cal Sil Silver, another fine student, um, much younger than I am. I feel like he's actually <laughs> closer to me in age than I realize. Um, yeah, Bob, I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, too bad for you. I have more hair. No, I'm sure hair is overrated. Um, in Texas, I think one of the things that's going to be a real question mark is how many voters show up on election day? Um, I've been through a million voters who've already voted in Harris County. These records are all public, so there's nothing here that is nefarious. Um, and what I've noticed is that Republicans are decidedly less than Democrats voting by mail. There's almost a two to one Democrat to Republican mail-in voting. And that's never happened before. But again, we've never had 30, 35% of the vote cast um, uh, by mail. Um, second, um, there is this idea that voting in person early probably is the safest way, right? Because you've got three weeks or had three weeks. You only got a couple of more days left. You had 120, 112 locations and in many cases over 100 hours. So you could pick the time, the day, and the location that was both convenient, short lines, and avoid um, contracting or spreading the virus. But still, there's a substantial portion of Republican voters who voted in the 16 and 18, and I see no evidence um, that they're going to be voting other than on election day. And if I were a Republican campaign consultant, I'd be very worried about that. When you turn out your vote, you want as many days and hours and locations to bring out your vote so that as you get closer to election day, you are conserving your resources, your time, your phone banks, your drivers for those people who are most either likely to procrastinate or be recalcitrant about voting early and you get them out. But if you have to turn out a substantial portion, and I don't know what substantial is yet, but a substantial portion of your vote on election day, something can go wrong. If you get in a line, then the line's long, and then early voting, you can always find another day, another time, another location. If you get in line on election day, there are not a lot of other options. There may be another location, another time, but not another day. More importantly, even if a small share of the vote shows up on election day, that can be a lot of voters. I estimate that we'll be seeing 1.6 million voters out of 2.4 million, that's 69% almost, of all voters in Harris County. If election day is not more than a quarter to a third of that, that could be 300,000 voters. That can be a lot of people trying to find a polling location that doesn't have a long line, that is safe, and that's convenient for the time of day they wanna vote, which as we all know, most people on election day vote in the morning before work or after work. Lunchtime is a quiet period. So I think the Republicans have probably put themselves in a disadvantage if they have to bring out their vote on election day. Not that I suspect they won't show up. They're a hardy group and uh, there's, I've been doing a ton of polling for the clerk on this. Everybody wants to vote. That's why we're having a high turnout. So I would watch to see whether or not the election day vote poses some problems for people. And that's where I think in a blue county like Harris, some Republicans I don't see many countywide candidates. The race that I would say is the most competitive in Harris County for Democrats and Republicans will be, be commissioner seat number three. That's Steve Raddick's seat. If you live in the north northwest portion of Harris County, he's been in um, commissioner's court for 25 years. Michael Moore and the mayor of Valley, I hope I get it right, Valley Stream. Um, Mr. Ramsey um, uh, are, are vying as a Republican. Um, there, I think um, Ramsey. Um, will be more competitive than um, many, many Republicans, uh, simply because I think he has a, a big advantage in their endorsement of Steve Raddick, who's an enormously popular commissioner and, and a tireless. One last thing, mail-in voting. People make mistakes. When you go from 8% to 30 to 35% of mail-in vote, guess what you go to? You go to a higher rate of error. People forget to sign their envelope, forget to put the ballot in the secure envelope, forget when to return the envelope, where to return the envelope. 
and possibly not mark the ballot properly. Getting those little bubbles marked in can be a challenge even for my students to say nothing of voters. So again, look for a, a higher rate. Normally about 1% to 1.5% of mail ballots are invalidated and they're almost invariably invalidated because of voter error. In this election, maybe not in Texas, but in states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, I'm sure there will be legal challenges to many mail ballots, not just the ones that are processed and certified, but in Pennsylvania, I expect the lawsuits will come about because of the way and that the location at which mail ballots are returned. Big fight over whether or not they can be returned to what we call remote drop-off locations. Uh, our governor has banned those in Texas to only one location, but in Pennsylvania, they have many locations um, and there's some debate about whether they're secure. I'm watching the, the chat. Yeah, the, the, the Giuliani, Giuliani asked about voter suppression. Um, in fairness to the debate about this, although I must say I have my own opinions on it, um, to Democrats, restricting mail-in voting to only people over 65 disabled and out of the jurisdiction, cutting back on drop-off locations, preventing voters from um, bringing in ballots for other people um, is voter suppression. I'll add to that voter ID. To Republicans, it's protection against voter fraud. So in a world that's polarized, where wearing a mask and socially distancing is a political statement, so is how you vote. I noticed that there were Republican voters on the voter list who'd been voting by mail for three or more consecutive federal elections and now have shifted to voting on election day, just like the president. One is troubled by that, um, as if somehow there is a, a sense of fraud in voting by mail. Vote by mail is far more secure than in-person voting. There is no evidence to date that there is anything other than infinitesimal trivial rates of voter fraud. Where they tend to occur um, is in the incredibly low turnout races that occur in off-year elections for school board and county commissioners where less than 100 or 200 people are voting, usually done by intercept. Somebody going into your mailbox and stealing the mail ballot. At a state or presidential or even congressional level, mail-in voting in Colorado, Utah, Washington, Oregon, where you're mailed a ballot before election is more secure than most in-person voting. My guess is that the Republicans have recognized that they cannot persuade nor win votes. And my story of demography, this isn't a story of persuasion. This is a story of the country changing fundamentally in terms of demographics. My colleague Steve Kleinberg has talked about this for the better part of 40 years. In the electorate, it's been slower. Steve's always saying, well, if I see the population changing, why doesn't the electorate change? It just takes time. People don't always vote when they turn 18. But it has changed and you're never going back. And what Republicans are doing is making the task of winning elections, I think, harder and harder. Yes, if they win the state house in Texas again, they will be in a position to redistrict. But at some point they have eroded, and I hate to be partisan about this, voters' confidence in the outcome of elections. And that's a problem as much for them as it is for the Democrats. And they have moved us further and further away from majority popular elections. You cannot run a democracy when the majority does not rule and you cannot expect obedience and compliance to the acts of government if voters no longer believe that the outcome of elections is fair. The best way to put this is this, elections are most important to the loser. The loser must believe that he or she could have won, but for their own failings of persuasion, of campaigning, and of, be, of being an effective candidate. If they come to believe that their defeat is at the hands of a nefarious party and it was unfair, then their followers will not come back and play the game again. And that's what I fear this election might produce, a further erosion in voters' confidence. Piper, do you wanna give everyone your comments? 
unmute yourself. Oh, sure. Well, I was kind of responding to your question there, Julie, and just saying that my husband is living internationally and he submitted his uh, ballot, but you have to take it to the embassy. And then it took almost two hours for him to be able to drop his ballot at the embassy. And then he got an email from the clerk saying that he had not signed the carrier envelope he did sign the exterior envelope when he dropped it off, but evidently we're guessing that they then put it in something else to get it to Harris County. And so it's just another example. Luckily, they did give him the opportunity to fill something else out by email and, oh. and they accepted his ballot. But, you know, some people are, well, he said he was there and I think he said 14 out of 16 people gave up because they didn't have two hours to stand around and wait to submit their ballot, so. Yeah, we've, well, we've done better. <laughs> we've made voting a little bit more convenient. And I think one of the consequences of the 2020 election and one of the positive consequences is it can be anything out of COVID other than a vaccine and the therapies is that we have come to accept um, and won't turn back um, some of these changes like mail-in mail voting um, and convenience voting, drive-through 24 hours, many of the things that our county clerk um, has implemented over the last year.